Good afternoon and welcome back to those of you who joined us earlier for the discussion of new regulations. My name is Corrine Lenz and I'm the content director here at Actual Media and I'll be your moderator for this regional update panel. Please keep an eye on the poll questions and be sure to cast your votes there. All right, so let's meet today's panelists. I'm gonna invite each of our panelists to make, just take a few minutes to introduce themselves, who they are, where they're from, what perspective they're bringing to today's discussion. And then once we've made those introdu introductions, we'll dive in uh, with both some prepared questions from me and some questions from the audience as they arise. So first up, we have Grant Walsam. Welcome, Grant. Thanks, Corinne. My name is Grant Walsam. I'm a professional and consulting engineer with XCG Consulting. I'm uh, proud to have served on the O'Neill Access Soil Working Group since 2014 and recently one of the founders of QP Co, which we established earlier in 2021. Been a QP for a number of contractors and large infra infrastructure projects this year, and it's been uh, quite rewarding and allowed me to get a, a unique perspective. Thank you, Grant. Oh, there we go. Got the presentation. Perfect. So the Ontario Regional Update I'll provide, um, as we all know, Regulation 40619 and the soil rules was released in December 2019 at the Soil Symposium, an earlier version. Uh, it was held in Ajax. It was well attended. I think there was well over 400 people uh, at that event, which was great. And the ministry used that as a, as a launching, um, launching board for, to release the uh, regulation in the soil rules. The first phase was... Uh, it was enacted and it came in force on January 1st, earlier this year, uh, which included the reuse rules, standards, and the waste designation. The second phase is just about to come, uh, January 1st of 2022, and will include the requirements for all the planning documents, the registry, and, and, and very importantly, the tracking and hauling records. To complete the regulation, there will be a landfill ban that comes on January 1st of 2025, where landfills will not be able to accept soils that are table 2.1 residential parkland quality or better. So they won't be able to use those for disposal, um, but they will be able to use those that quality soil for operational things like sound berms, roads, et cetera. Recent activities that have happened um, in Ontario is the Ministry of Environment did a great job on hosting uh, eight specific topics, webinars um, through the month of November. It was quite a busy time uh, for those who were lucky enough to get on those webinars. Um, the slide decks have been available, uh, made available to share around, and I, we're looking at different modes to make sure that those are available through, whether it's through the ONEA Access Law website, the QP code, but right now they're being shared around uh, by email. My understanding is as well that the, the ministry is taking the Q&A responses and they're preparing the responses and we're gonna make those available. Those will take a little bit of time. There was a lot of questions and with eight sessions, it's, it's taken them a while to get through them. But my gut feel is that those will be available sometime in the new year. Uh, Denise mentioned this earlier this morning on, on the first session that uh, REPRA, the registry that's gonna be for excess soil is now online as of December 1st. Um, they met their time commitments and it's on time and, and uh, ready for, uh, use uh, as of 2022. Um, their info sessions and slide decks, uh, recordings of the sessions are available on their website. And I can provide that a little bit later, a website there. Other great things that are happening is ancillary businesses and organizations are forming. Uh, we've seen the emergence of uh, some great soil tracking software, uh, matching service, which I think uh, is gonna be discussed a little later today. And we're, I'm interested to see if there's going to be a soil bank, you know, a commercially run soil bank, and uh, that'll be uh, interesting. And I'm not aware of any, um, but that'll be that'll be kind of cool if that comes up. Other things uh, like uh, the consulting services that apply, supply QP services are starting to now come up with almost departments because of the demand for QP um, for excess soil. So um, we're seeing a lot of emergence in that, and they're becoming experts in their firms to provide services to their clients. And uh, QP Co, which is Qualified Persons Community of Ontario, was formed earlier this year, and not necessarily for just excess soil, but also for uh, brownfields and uh, records of site condition. Um, but that's been formed, and, and very proud of that. We have over 100 members now, and we're doing great things with the great partnership that we have with the Ministry of Environment on, on a number of things. 
successes. And we're starting to see uh, some behavioral changes uh, from the old way of doing things. It's gonna take some time um, for everybody to get on board, but we're starting to see those changes over this, this past year. We also saw a number of municipal contracts that were executed in 2021 for infrastructure jobs, sewer, water main, roads, et cetera, that included the requirements of the regulatory uh, um, requirements and access to tracking and characterization and, and uh, the destination assessment reports. Um, and those went very well. The ones that I was involved with that, I, that I'm aware of went very well. Great implementation, understanding by the municipalities and including their QPs and getting the contractors up to speed that were involved in those projects and, and the acceptance of, of the regulatory requirements. So that was really good. And I think that's gonna bode well for those contractors that are gonna be involved in projects for next year, but also the municipalities that now have a year under their belt, um, really before it was actually required. We're also seeing some innovations in reuse um, and acceptance of soil, uh, project area processing. I think those are all great things. And they should be looked at successes in ensuring that we're able to find good beneficial reuses for the excess soil. Areas that I think we can grow um, is further acceptance, awareness, implementation, and uptake of the regulation. Uh, events like what we're, what we're participating in today is, is, is amazing. Um, webinars and so forth. And, and my recommendation to everybody is take in as much as you can. This is a, a detailed regulation. Um, there's a lot of nuances and we can all learn from each other, but get becoming experts in this um, for your clients and for your coworkers is really what's going to be key. And I think that's where we can all grow as an industry. What I'd like to see and from what I've seen so far in 2021 is better, better, better documentation for projects. And I've seen some great reports done by a few people that are participating today, but we need better documentation, good characterization, comparison to the, the proper regulations, uh, the standards identification of the types of sites. And I think that there's been a lot of um, trying to get things done under the, under the, under the, uh, the wire before the regulation comes into play. But you know, I, I've actually seen uh, uh, project leaders and their QPs trying to get acceptance for um, receiving the soil with like two samples for like 20,000 cubic meters. It's just not acceptable. And we really need to get, get better documentation. And we as an industry together need to get that, that bar raised. Uh, other things, industry-led tools and guidance, and I think we all have a part to play in ensuring that, uh, you know, things that we can do to help each other, guides and uh, best management practices, those types of things, uh, I think we can all grow there, and some clarity from the Ministry of Environment. I know that uh, the frequently asked questions, part of the webinars, uh, are, are made available. They have a number of questions that need to be um, answered yet to get those out, but finding a good forum for that, whether it's on their website, uh, uh, combining with an industry-led uh, partner that could provide that access to that information. I think we need, we need that growth there for all of us to be able to, uh, to uh, learn from that. So that's it from Ontario. I think there's a lot that's gone on. It's a busy year, uh, another busy year coming. But I'm going to hand it over to uh, Kate Branch, who's going to talk to us about uh, what's going on in BC. Kate? Hi, Grant. Uh, yes, thank you so much. My name is Kate Branch. I'm a partner and uh, principal engineer here at Core 6 Environmental. I'm also currently uh, the president of the BC EIA, so I'm uh, happy to be um, here presenting on the BC um, situation. So here in BC, we're currently in a transition period. Um, new policies and directions are, um, have yet to be brought into full uh, force. The information um, providing today is largely based on an intention paper that was put out by the Ministry of Environment and, and that can be accessed uh, quite easily through their website. Um, I think some of the things that I'm presenting today may not um, and likely aren't uh, reflective of what the final will look like, but it's, uh, it's kind of like the best of what's out there. Um, what was noted with our current uh, situation was that uh, the reuse of soils at other sites uh, wasn't easily um, uh, undertaken. Uh, it lacked efficiency. Uh, source sites often just redirected soils to, to landfills just to make things easier or, outside, or, or to sites outside the provincial regulatory jurisdiction. So to address this, uh, the ministry is looking to revamp this process. Um, the new regulation is meant to kind of bring focus to sites where Schedule 2 activities have occurred. And so for those outside of BC, uh, Schedule 2 activities are a prescribed set of um, 
activities that have a, a higher likelihood of uh, causing contamination. So we're talking auto salvage, dry cleaning, uh, heavy industrial sites. And so um, you can see there on the slide that the, the uh, changes have already been made to our Environmental Management Act um, and that received royal assent in March 2020. And since that time, uh, the ministry has undertaken some public consultation. So areas of focus right now are just to, um, to get into place the notification process for tracking soil. Uh, within the province, um, hardwiring in a bit of, uh, you know, the grant spoke to this in terms of uh, soil characterizations at sites. Um, and then also some additional uh, requirements for high volume uh, receiving sites. So if we could just get the next slide, please. So as mentioned, the intention uh, paper was uh, published in 2021. Um, since that time, uh, they opened up a public comment period and they, uh, the ministry received quite a few, I think there were 61 uh, submissions uh, from various people. And then they also held some focus groups uh, with specific um, groups, including uh, people from the development industry, consulting, contracting, uh, Indigenous representatives. So uh, a lot of comments were received and there's also now on their website, um, a summary of those comments. And I think uh, based on some conversations I had, uh, the plan now is to provide uh, a cabinet with a, a revised policy direction paper in the spring of uh, 2022. And I know that initially they had discussed kind of like a six month transition uh, period just to get people uh, used to everything uh, before everything comes into full, full force. Um, next slide, please. So some of the aspects of the intention paper, uh, you know, at this point, it lists a minimum volume. So any sites that uh, were moving soils of less than 10 cubic meters would be exempt. I think there may be some tweaks of that volume, but initially that was set at kind of, you know, a truckload or two. Um, and then there was a great desire to get in uh, this notification uh, system so that people, uh, both the ministry, uh, municipalities, um, and Indigenous nations had the, uh, the ability to see what was kind of moving around the province. And so, um, and the other aspect, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, was that federal reserve lands now will no longer be exempt from this. And so notification for movement out of and to federal reserve lands are, are meant to be drawn in by this regulation. So that's, that's new for us. And then I, I, I take us back to that soil characterization. And again, I think the QEPs will have to become quite involved with that. Um, the intention paper kind of referenced a technical guidance. Um, I find, uh, so the personal opinion, that that technical guidance is kind of set up more so for um, for the investigation of hot spots and stepping out from uh, those, and and less so on on uh, confirming that as you know that the soil is is um, clean. Uh, so I think there probably is some work um, work there to be done because at this point, uh, the volume uh, kind of uh, per sample per, per volume is quite uh, quite low, and so I think we could see some some extensive costs uh, added to developments, but uh, something still to work on. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, I, I wanted to talk about high volume sites. So that's been kind of tagged as sites that will be receiving 20,000 cubic meters over their lifespan. And uh, there is a desire to bring in just a little bit more um, kind of, uh, I guess, awareness and risk management of those sites. Um, so it, it will uh, be a situation where um, those sites will have to or may have to institute some sort of liners or leachate collection systems and, and uh, some ongoing groundwater monitoring just to um, protect uh, potential receptors. Um, I think uh, given the floods that we've experienced over the, the, the last little bit, I think uh, climate uh, change mitigation implications with these high uh, volume sites is going to be uh, become a, a focus. I think uh, we'll be seeing um, potentially some exemptions for, for uh, diking around um, um, sites, but uh, also I think uh, there has to be some discussions about uh, elevation, um, the rising of, of elevations on sites to protect them. Uh, and then the other thing that kind of uh, tweaks on, on the regulation is uh, how to manage uh, linear uh, construction projects. And so, you know, at what point do linear construction pro uh, projects uh, potentially become a receiving site? Um, and so there may be some exemptions that come in for those types of things. So, yeah, that's kind of uh, my message today is just stay tuned. I think um, 
uh, a lot will be coming here uh, quickly in the spring, and, and I, I appreciated uh, the opportunity to meet with the ministry in those focus groups and kind of bring some, some kind of real world um, um, and um, have uh, the discussion around what, what could uh, potentially work better, because I think at the end of the day, what we want to see is, is soils remaining uh, closer to home and not being redirected uh, necessarily to landfills. So that's the end of my presentation. I think I'll pass uh, the, the speaker's um, mic over to, to Nicola now. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Hello, everyone. So my name is Nicolas Barato. Uh, I'm a project director for WSP Canada, and I'm based in Quebec City. I have been a contaminated land specialist for uh, nearly 15 years. And for the last six years, uh, my work consisted in managing the one of the largest contaminated site uh, remediation in Quebec, uh, the Turco Interchange Project, which is a good uh, situation where excess soil and contaminated soil management was uh, a challenge. Uh, so today, uh, let me walk you through quickly uh, a quick update on the Quebec Action Plan for Soil Protection and Contaminated Site Remediation uh, before digging into some key points about excess soil valorization. So. Uh, on this slide, uh, summarizing a lot of elements uh, on the Quebec Action Plan. So the, the main main information here, uh, we are at the end of the of the the time span for that action plan, which was started in 2017, and uh, going from the high level stakes to the uh, action points. You'll see at the bottom that. Uh, from the 21 points that were uh, brought in this action plan, uh, some of them are dedicated or at least focused on excess soil and contaminated soil management. So, um, for example, uh, the, the action plan aimed to update the background contamination levels in soil, which determines uh, uh, the quality of the soil to import and, and the, the, the re reception quality, uh, the quality of the reception site. Um, one of the other focus of the ministry was to make sure that uh, other uh, more valor valorization options would be offered to, uh, to the industry. Uh, there, there was also a, a aim of publishing a guide on this valorization, so making sure that uh, guidelines and, and uh, options are clear and, and, and shared to the industry. Uh, and the last element that was uh, uh, a key point of, of the action plan was to enforce a fee for the burial or the landfilling of contaminated soils. And this is, the, these points are, are part, of course, are, are of other uh, objectives of that action plan uh, for soil protection. Uh, on to the next slide, please. Uh, so, as for the uh, excess soil valorization update, uh, so I've tried to summarize here a um, uh, timeline uh, starting in 2007, where when all excess soils, it was declared that all excess soils should not degrade the quality of the reception site. So that's the basis of, of our management here in Quebec. I guess it's the same elsewhere. Uh, and this is where the, the first soil excess soil valorization options were were uh, published. Um, uh, since this time, um, especially when we had to apply these options uh, on large sites, there was a, an opening or opening or at least a consideration of more and more site specific standards where we could uh, use a higher level evaluation of the site to, to reuse soil. And then uh, from from there on uh, until 2016, uh, all the application of of this excess soil management uh, pushed uh, the industry forward and and, and the regulatory um, guidelines too. So we saw in 2016 uh, the publish the publication of the action guide and, and its subsequent updates until last year, uh, well 2019. Uh, uh, adding new more and more options to, to the, the excess soil reuse. Uh, for example, berms for visual and noise screens or even in mines for a mine uh, remediation. Um, and, and then uh, the, those specific applications, those options were 
specified in new regulations. So one of them being in 2019, uh, the query, uh, sand pits and queries regulations where uh, excess soils were allowed, slightly contaminated excess soil were allowed to be used in query restoration, for example. Uh, but then from, that, uh, from this time, all subsequent regulations uh, that you that you would see down the, the timeline here uh, related to valorization of residual materials, for example. Uh, we've seen more and more options, but only in specific regulations. And this is where maybe the, the biggest challenge will, will, will is today is that we are still waiting to see a connection or at least um, not a connection, but some kind of reality check on, 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 the, on the field where we have to apply those those regulation and and the reuse of of certain materials. For example, uh, the the regulation regarding the valorization of residual materials that was uh, published la last year um, pushed the industry to consider the crushed stone, for example, or all um, granular material as, as residual material. So, making sense in a way, uh, the 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 application of, of this regulation down the, 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 the project line and, and, and so far as the, the industry and the construction operations may, may need some, some more uh, clarif clarification. Um, and the last one that we, in fact, we are in, in the transition right now, it started back in uh, November uh, this year and will go until end of 2022 is the contaminated soil traceability system. So we are putting into place a, a, a central system, system to, um, to track those contaminated soil movements. And this is um, true for uh, today for some certain projects based on the volumes, but we'll, we'll have an uptake and we'll cover the, all the projects uh, by the end of 2022. Um, so we've seen historically more and more options, but there are still, as I've said earlier, grayness and, and limitations to the, those options. We want to, to see uh, some, some clarifications on the, 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 the easy reuse of those soils to avoid, of course, land thinning because it's, it is still an option. Um, and, and this will go through making sure that uh, all this regulation applies well uh, apply well uh, in the in, in the in the projects. Uh, so the upcoming challenges, uh, I think it's uh, making sure that the industry uptakes the the regulation, owns the owns the application, and have the help of of the the regulatory organization and and ministry to to make sure that the valorization is not any more limited to to today's options, but. Uh, a greater, a greater application. Uh, this is it. Uh, back to you, Corinne. Great, thank you. I'm just taking a quick look at our polls here, and it's interesting to note that we've got six percent of our audience is from the West Coast. We got sixty percent from Central here, and then thirty-three from the East Coast, and just one percent from the North Coast. So I don't think we have a North Coast <laughs> in the Northern region. Not so much the Central Coast either, for that matter. Um, I should not be allowed to ad lib. Anyway, let's start in with our questions here. So first off, I'm gonna I'm, I have a question for you first, Grant. How are Ontario regulators managing concerns from industry in regards to the new regulations? That's a good question. And, and um, I, I can only get anecdotally uh, from my friends at the Land Policy Division, but my understanding is from, from, from the get-go when this was originally proposed that it was nothing but positive feedback that they got. Of course, there's going to be a little bit of pushback uh, um, uh, change is, is difficult. Um, we're talking about uh, the tried and true on construction management, soil management. Um, so there is going to be some hiccups, of course. And, and of course, I'm sure that the ministry's heard about that. Um, but my understanding that they take every request um, uh, into consideration. Um, but, you know, at, at times that, that pushback just can't be addressed. And I understand, you know, there's also some, been some requests for delays. And um, which I understand as well um, to delay that the second phase, but uh, my understanding is as well that it, you know you have to go through and change the regulation, and you have to get cabinet approval and so forth. So 
I think a timing thing might also be in consideration there and how that's going. Uh, I know that the land policy division works hard to address all questions and comments, um, but we do have to understand that, you know, the government resources are limited and they're, they're, they're operating like much of us are in the private industry on, you know, doing more with less, um, having budget constraints, um, staffing constraints, et cetera. So I, I do understand <clears throat> that times you may not get a question answered as quick as possible, but uh, I know that they do take those, those questions seriously and they're trying to get them answered as expedient as possible. Uh, I also know that they're taking um, invitations to speak at events and webinars and conferences. You know, I think COVID has really impacted how things are, are able to be communicated. And I know that, you know, early in the process of, of the regulation, we were at the onset of COVID and there was a lot of issues. Um, pivoting into being able to hold normally in-person events uh, to a webinar format like we are now. I think we're getting to be very pro uh, of those things now. We're getting to be old pros, but I think we're also getting a little tired of them. Um, and, and I think, you know, information exchange is different. And I think that, you know, we all have to, you know, understand that as well. Um, but I think the, the, you know, the ministry's done a good job. They quickly pivoted and got those webinars done over November. I think that was a very, fairly quick and rapid response to some concerns that were being raised that the information wasn't being held or, or exchanged um, coming up to the next phase in January. So I think they did a good job in that manner. And I think, you know, we have to understand that, you know, resources are limited across the board. That's a very fair point. What can we, what can industry and BC do to prepare for the significant, significant changes ahead? I mean, Kate, obviously this question sort of resonates with you most. Mm -hmm. I think that we'll see a shift. Uh, I think often, um, uh, you know, bringing in the contaminated sites, uh, qualified professionals often occurred to kind of later in design or later in the construction process. So, you know, come help me manage this stuff I'm digging up. I think uh, more so that work is going to have to be front ended uh, just to, to allow for efficient movement of soil uh, and the notification period and, and the kind of the questions back and forth. Um, a lot of that work is going to have to be front loaded. And so that's a, that's a definite change because, uh, it, uh, like I say, we, we were often called in at the last <laughs> last moment and with the notification it's it's gonna change and the soil characterization is a big change for, for industry. I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not used to having to characterize clean soil to, to such a great extent. And so uh, it's kind of, um, you know, the assumption was always, okay, well, I found that, you know, the site is not contaminated in the area where I expected. So uh, therefore everywhere else should be clean too. Uh, that will be requiring a, a bit more scientific backing. And, and it'll be interesting to see the kind of um, the sweet spot that we get into because you want enough to be scientifically defensible, but then you also don't want to be, have it be so financially and time uh, you know, um, sensitive that, uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, it's just easier. What you don't want to see is, is people going back to the, the process of it's easier to just send it to a landfill, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. And Nick, you're welcome. Nicholas, how are Quebec construction companies changing the way they manage and optimize excavated materials in, in light of rehabilitation policy action plan? So um, I think we're, we're, uh, we're on, the, on the right path. Um, one of the, the interesting points is, is uh, the context. We are seeing more and more uh, large projects that, allows, that allow flexibility to assess new methods or try new methods and, and change the, uh, the traditional work plans to, to, to apply those new regulations. Um, we also see more and more collaboration uh, between constructors and consultants, for example, to understand the, 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 the requirements, but also to find efficient ways of, of uh, operating on the site. Uh, one thing for sure in Quebec is that there is a big uptake of uh, new technologies and innovative solutions uh, from the construction, construction industry. And I think this is, this is a, a key point for, uh, for all these new uh, excess soil tracking system, for example, or contaminated soil tracking system. Uh, but how, as I said earlier, uh, there is still a need uh, to work closely with the regulator, make sure that we work hand in hand to get those uh, guidelines or, or at least this uh, gray interpretation areas be uh, clarified. Okay. 
So we have a question here from the audience that I'm going to, it's a hypothetical question. So a receiver site, i.e. aggregate pit, has been identified for environmental restoration. It is found to have regionally rare plant species that are not included in SAR. These may be impacted by the filling process itself, regardless of the quality of the fill. No other impacts are expected to human health or the environment. Can this sort of project go ahead? Uh, anyone like to take a stab at that? <laughs> A good question, Corrine, and and I think you would have to have some some, some serious discussions with your conservation authority on those rare plant species. I think we you know we have to look at the environment and the human health together, and I think it's a it's a give and take. Um, I don't think we can just uh, turn a blind eye to that. It's the same as the invasive species; we can't turn a blind eye to that either. We need to be aware that we're not relocating those invasive species, but we also don't want to be damaging the rare things. But you know, I think it comes back to all other things like uh, rare species of, of animals and birds and migratory pathways and so forth. Um, so I think you know that all has to be taken into consideration. But I think that some some unique discussions have to be held with the conservation authority. Can those plants be preserved in some way um, that won't be impacted, or can they be relocated? And I know that's a you know a very rare thing. And as a an environmental civil can. Uh, uh, consultant, I'm not sure I, I'm the best person to answer about <laughs> the biology of those types of things, but I think for sure that, you know, conservation authorities should be in, involved in, in, uh, in having those discussions. And I, uh, actually in, in Quebec, the regulator uh, added this invasive species requirement when you manage soil outside of the site, of the, the origin site. So this is a, we are seeing wider options, but then on the other side, we're seeing new requirements related, for example, to invasive species, which maybe uh, compensate this opening to uh, and, and limitation on the other side. Thank you. All right, let's get back to our regularly scheduled questions here. Is there sufficient and effective communication to industry about excess soils legislation? And this question is open to everyone. Yeah, I, I think I can provide a, a BC perspective in that we've had quite a bit of lead time and lots of opportunities for comment, um, lots of webinars. There's been a you know, significant number on, on various dates. Uh, and so really there's no, other than uh, a personal choice, there's, there's really no reason for not, uh, you know, not having some of the information. Uh, it may not be clear, uh, and there may be some, some um, continued conversation that needs to be happening with, with consulting engineers to, to help or consultants to, to help with that process. But industry should be uh, aware of what's coming. Um, the question will be, at, you know, in, in our stage right now with the comment period is whether or not, uh, or how, how much the comments uh, provided to ministry will be integrated into the final document and the final right. regulation, right? Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Grant or Nicholas, would you like to jump in? Um, I can jump in. I think, you know, communication is a, is a funny thing. You know, if you give them too much lead time, uh, they won't take it seriously. And uh, in terms of, you know, outreach and so forth, you know, we've been talking in Ontario for a couple of years, but I don't think anybody really took it seriously until they started seeing these deadlines coming and coming fast. And I think then, then the desire for the information has been there. And I think, you know, it, so it's a fine balance. Um, you know, I think we all are, are evolving too with COVID on how do we want to receive our communication? And, you know, do we have the standard channels like websites and LinkedIn, but we have uh, you know, newer uh, media sources, the social media where our younger generation tends to, to gravitate to and, and be able to pick up on. Um, other things like trade publications like Environmental Journal and Renew and, and so forth, you know, um, as much as you guys want to be helping helping industry, you don't want to have excess soil additions every every uh, every time you do an, an addition. So uh, it, it's a fine balance. But I think you know at some point we all have to take responsibility for our own communication and being a receptor to that communication. So um, you know if we need more, then we should be asking for more. And I think that's that's key as well. Perfect. Yeah, and I'll that I'll add that also a good relation with with your local regulator representative to ask questions and and it can be really specific questions on on site uh, context is is also a key in this communication Thanks. all right we have another question here from our audience what exactly triggers the use of brat 
if an impacted soil does not meet the guidelines of the excess soil rules, can a MGRA approach be used to identify RMMS that can help ensure the risks are mitigated? That's an Ontario question, so I guess that gets volleyed <laughs> into my box. I didn't recognize any here. of those acronyms, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stay quiet here. Yeah. Um, the brand is a great tool uh, in assessing whether or not the site that you have uh, can ex uh, receive soils that are outside the generic standard. Um, so for sure, the uh, risk assessment approach can always be used. It's not going to cure all. Um, you know, you may have some soil that still will not meet that uh, the site use or the, the characteristics of that site. Uh, depth of groundwater, all of those types of things. So, um, but it is a great tool. And I know that it's been a little slow on the uptake. I've had the opportunity to be involved with a couple and uh, worked really well for one client, didn't work well for another client and they didn't get the results that they wanted. Um, going the next step and getting that filed with the ministry uh, for a specific use on that property. I don't know if that's happened yet in Ontario. Uh, my, my latest discussions at QP Co, nobody admitted um, that, they, that they they knew of any of those or it happened, but I think it's a great tool. I think it will be used, but it's probably going to be very limited and very site specific. All right. With 60% of our audience being from Ontario, you're a popular guy uh, from Ontario, Grant. <laughs> um, so I'm going to slip in a more general question and then we'll come back to our questions from the audience. What can be done to improve the reuse of soils across Canada? Any national or international initiatives to highlight? And again, this is open to anyone who'd like to jump in. I think, uh, first of all, you guys have done a great job on, on taking this topic and going national, knowing that Ontario, we've, we've got a lot, but there's things going on in Quebec, there's things going on in BC, and I think that the other provinces will follow, um, knowing that you know it's, the, it's, it's a good thing to do and, and ensure the quality of the soil. So taking these things national, I think CBN also may have a part to play because a lot of the people that, that are involved with the Canadian Brownfield Networks also do you know development and... Uh, you know, consultants and so forth that are dealing with, with remediation. A lot of those skills are crossed over and a lot of us uh, do do both. Uh, so I think things like that. Other things that I, I've looked at is maybe coming up with things like uh, lead points for reuse of soil on your sites. And I think that, you know, if we've got some awareness around that and was able to uh, find a way to provide that to the developers who are looking for those lead, lead projects, if there's a way to include excess soils and reuse, beneficially reusing soils would be great. Um, so those are a couple of ideas that I've had. One thing also maybe to mention uh, regarding this, not national approach, but maybe interregional approach is that we will maybe see more and more movement of excess soils between two regions on a, on a, along a, a, a border. So the, even if there is no uh, national initiative or national orga organization taking care of that, we'll, we'll have to see uh, uh, at least communication and collaboration between two regions for, for those specific uh, cases. And this is where uh, making sure that we speak to the right person and we share uh, uh, the expertise and, and, the, and the requirements on both sides will probably benefit two regions uh, as a side effect. I think also, you know, as, as we turn uh, more so towards a climate change strategy, I think instituting some of those aspects into our decision making around excess soils will, will lead to reuse and, and beneficial reuse as opposed to just, uh, you know, wasting it uh, as, uh, as cover in a landfill. Okay. All right, we have another question from the audience here. How will Ontario manage small scale projects and make sure the private citizen follows the regulation? A large portion of rehab fill used in pits and quarries is from these small projects. How do we verify they follow the new regulation? Again, it sounds like an Ontario <laughs> question. I think that it was does. Anthony. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Put me on the hot spot again. Um, small scale projects, there are the, the limitation sizes, the 350 and 100 uh, cubic meter um, triggers. Um, and pits and quarries, yes. They do take, we have to remember too, that if we're dealing with small scales, what's the source and what are the opportunities for actually that soil being impacted in any way that may not be uh, adverse or adverse to the health, human health and the environment and so forth. So that's the, the thing, what's the triggers in terms of volume? What's the potential uh, for impacts in that soil? 
Um, so pits and quarries, yes, you know, they are, can be sensitive because of the connection to groundwater and so forth and where they are um, outside the urban areas and so forth. But I think we have to understand what the source is. If we're talking about guys that are digging back, backyard pools uh, for residential properties that are likely not in industrialized areas, not where things like dry cleaners and gas station and industry, uh, industrial properties may have had an impact. I think we're, we're probably pretty safe. Um, and that's why those small triggers are in there. Um, but I think we all have, we, we do have to look at those things, ensure that the source of the material is good, good quality with very little or low potential for impact. Perfect. All right, well, we have about five and a half minutes left here. So I think what we should do is I'd, I'd love to get your, a few last thoughts from you. What do you think is the best way to raise awareness about regional standards in an accessible and equitable way? Uh, are there any specific resources that you can point our audience to? Um, and I'm just gonna go around uh, to each of you and get your thoughts. Um, I think we'll start with you, Kate, if you're oh, ready to go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, you, you know, um, I would say the ministry websites are, are being revamped and, and that's uh, obviously kind of the, the, the first stop. I think there are a lot of uh, industry associations um, information out there that can be obtained. Um, yeah just um, searching out these webinars again, like, you know, sometimes we complain about the virtual aspect of them, but they are, it does make it more accept, uh, accessible to more people. And so it allows you also to learn uh, more easily about uh, what, what's happening in other provinces and, and kind of taking that um, to your own work. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And Nicholas? Yeah. So uh, as Kate said, the, uh, the, the regulatory website is the, the first source of information. And, and for Quebec, we're seeing more and more uh, application guides. So whenever a regulation is, is published, then there's usually a guide that, well, at least we are seeing guides coming with them. So this is a good way of, of getting this information. The action guide from 2016 uh, is the our principal uh, tool uh, uh, when we work every day, and that's that's the the, the main uh, you 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 have to uh, to get the the last update on the on the regulatory website, um, and yeah, the the this kind of webinars also uh, allows the group to to connect and and uh, to to widen the 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 network of experts, and this is where also. Uh, getting out of those webinars, maybe uh, new uh, focus groups or or initiatives can can uh, raise arise and 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 benefit the industry. Thank you. All right, Grant, bring us home. Um, there's a lot of and both Kate and and, and Nicholas said some great things, and, and I think events like today's event is really key on, on raising awareness. We see that there's a great participation here. Um, you know, industry associations are really key for, for ensuring that that their membership is being looked after and, you know, the information around, say, excess soil is being tailored to them. So if it's, a, you know, hauling, hauling groups that the you know, information that they need to be aware of is delivered to them. So sometimes it takes a little bit of tailoring, but there are a lot of requests right now going out for industry association presentations and so forth. I think the ministry is being asked. I think uh, people uh, that are in it are being asked. I know that I'm participating in a couple more come the new year. Um, so continuing to listen and learn from each other, ask questions and, and take advantage of events like today's. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time today to be with us. And thank you to our sponsors. Please don't forget to check out our sponsors in the uh, virtual showroom we have in the Google app. Uh, we certainly wouldn't be able to host these discussions without uh, so much industry support. So thank you very much, stay safe, and we will see you back here this afternoon for some more fun in the 2021 Excess Soil Symposium.